live from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez. America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to the Tuesday night edition of the program, and happy to be here with you. If you want to join in on our late night national town hall conversation, feel free to give me a call, 833-482-5337, 833-4VALDEZ is the number. And lots, uh, lots of stuff going on, right? I think Trump's won the Michigan primary. Uh, what else do we have? We also have communists marching through the streets in New York City. And this is an interesting one. Very interesting because, I mean, after all, when was the last time you saw a bunch of commies with a big banner that says socialist revolution and a hammer and a sickle and waving red flags with hammers and sickles on them? You'd think you were in Soviet Russia back in the 80s. But that happened in Brooklyn, New York, and it's uh, been taking the um, social media by storm. It's all over the place. Everybody's playing those clips of it. Almost like a gotcha, right? You know, it's like a gotcha. Uh, Because, you know, this is what uh, so many of us see coming, and uh, it seems to be getting worse, and the the socialists are becoming emboldened. Anyway, that happened, and uh, we have a clip of audio. I want you to listen to a little bit of what they were chanting. Check this out. All right, so if you, if you, if I'm not sure if you heard that, uh, it was a little low in my ear, but hopefully you guys heard it. And it said, there's only one solution communist revolution. And they just kept uh, chanting this and chanting this. And it makes me think, you know, man, everybody thinks communism is a great idea until it's staring them in the face, until you meet somebody who's been through that, right? I have a, I've talked about him ad nauseum on this program, my friend Ruben, Ruben the Cuban, uh, who uh, owned the restaurant. Uh, with his wife and uh, family restaurant. It was a great restaurant. They got rid of it recently. And he's actually back in Cuba now. He's been dealing with some family issues. But Ruben will be the first one to tell you, you know, when we argue, he and I, I say, they're trying to bring communism to America. And he laughs at me, laughs. And he says, bro, look up. See that thing over there by the window? It's an air conditioner. There's no air conditioning in Cuba. And he makes the case that, you know, communism is is so brutal and so murderous. and, And in reality, it is. The case that I'm making to him is that it's slowly coming. And when it comes to America, it's not going to look like it did in Cuba. It's not going to look like it did in Venezuela, like the guy who was driving me around when I went to visit Medellin, Colombia last month, uh, the um, cab driver, Uber driver, who told me that um, he wasn't even allowed to drive Uber because the authorities in Colombia were so tight on on that. But that had nothing to do with communism. Uh, Well, it, it did. That's actually how it started the conversation. He said, you know how these leftists are. And I said, oh, snap. And he said, well, you know, the guy that's in charge in Colombia now is a very left-leaning um, type of guy, taking a page from the playbook of the Venezuelans. And this guy was Venezuelan from another neighboring country. And he just started telling me how people were eating out of trash cans and how difficult life was. And that's why he was driving Uber in Colombia. And eye-opening. But again, he saw it. He knew it. He understood, just like our guest last night, Xi Van Fleet. She, Van Fleet, excuse me. She... Um, escaped China, communist China, and she knew all about it, right? Because once you've been through this, you see it coming. That is what I think all Americans need to do. We need to see stuff coming. Somebody who didn't see this coming was Mayor Eric Adams. Now, on this program, I don't know, a week or three ago, we played a clip of Eric Adams back in 2021 saying, we are not going to change the sanctuary city policy. We are going to keep it as it is. New York City always is and always will be a sanctuary city. I think you heard that, right? I don't do a great Eric Adams impression. But now he's out there saying something new. New York City Mayor Eric Adams, who is uh, presiding over all these you know, um, 
migrants that are coming to the city illegally, and you've got them occupying hotel after hotel after hotel after hotel. Some some of these hotels are 30 stories high. Just imagine, um, you know, 100 rooms, 200 rooms, 600 rooms, filled with people living there for seven months at a clip as a shelter. Imagine that. Living better than you and me in many cases, right? Many of us don't live in a three- or four-star hotel on a daily basis. Um, if life could only be so good. But Mayor Eric Adams, uh, he um, he's now saying yesterday at an event that we need to modify the sanctuary city law that if you commit a felony, we should be able to turn you over to ICE. Listen to this. The overwhelming number of migrants and asylum seekers that are here, they, wanted, they want to work. I still don't understand why the federal government is not allowing them to work. They need to have the right to work, like all of us that have come to this country had the ability to do so. But those small numbers that are committing crimes, we need to modify the, uh, the sanctuary city law that if you commit a felony, a violent act, we should be able to turn you over to ICE and have you deported. It is a right to live in this city, and you should be, you should be not committing crimes in our city for doing so. Right now, we don't have the authority to do so. Well, I agree with Eric Adams. I think he sounds like me uh, back in 2020, 2021, and uh, every year since then. Absolutely. It's called the law. It's called law and order. It's called doing the right thing. People waiting their turn. This, this garbage, these lies about a sanctuary city, the sanctuary city should be a sanctuary for the citizens of the city, not for people that are barging in. And again, I'm not trying to villainize these people. I understand that, that their, um, their Uncle Joe, as uh, my buddy Curtis Lee would calls him, El Papi Chulo, Joe Biden, he invited them, and they're here because of his invitation. Then he changed all the rules to let them all in. So clearly, there's only one person that's really at fault here, and it's Joe Biden, or at least principally at fault. But for the first time ever, I agree with Eric Adams. I think he makes sense on this, and hopefully he can stick with it now. I think he's trying to mitigate the fallout from the people. People all over the city that are freaking out with this. They're like, man, the city's going to hell in a handbasket. What are we going to do? So he's trying to get on board with the people. But who he doesn't have on board, as uh, Councilwoman Vicky Palladino pointed out, is his own city council. That despite his best efforts to talk a good one here, they're not on board with changing the sanctuary city policy because they really want that. Ultimately, The Marxist in them wants the system to be overrun. That's what they believe in. That's how Marxists operate. So Eric Adams is trying to be a politician as best he can to balance the situation for a positive outcome for him. Not for the people, but for him. And I don't think he's going to get one. Because ultimately, they're just going to keep sending people over until we do something to shut down the border. And as long as we have one candidate, I, I, one candidate, I haven't heard Nikki Haley say anything about shutting down the border, and she may have said one or two things, but I haven't heard them. Largely, all I hear her talk about is how bad Trump is, and all I hear Trump talk about is how we need to shut the border and how he's being indicted more than Al Capone, and he's right. It seems like there's one person that cares about the southern border, and it's been Donald Trump since 2015. What's up with that? Papi Chulo Joe Biden? What's up with that, Eric Adams? What's up with that, Nikki Haley? I think a few more politicians need to pick up this mantle and say, you know what? We're going to put America first. We're going to put the people first. And we're going to do something to secure the border. This affects the economy. It affects everything. So you get all these phony, fluffed-up job reports that we've been getting. You get all sorts of things that come in with the economy. And it's very difficult to measure all of this. But ultimately, that's where we are. So I want to have a conversation on the economy straight ahead as we uh, head into uh, Super Tuesday next week and we're coming off the Michigan primary. And obviously, there, um, that was the number one issue for most people, inflation in the economy. And now it's become immigration, where people, uh, including Democrats, are saying, look, we don't like what's going on. And they're not even thrilled about Joe Biden being on the ballot. So let's see what type of role the economy is going to continue to play and uh, where we are in our current state of affairs straight ahead. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. 
That's Valdez with an S. All right, America, welcome back. Your calls and more, 833-482-5337. Let's go to San Francisco. Check in with one of our favorite dissenters, David, calling from San Francisco, listening online. Go right ahead. Uh, Well, thanks, uh, Rich. The uh, Sanctuary City uh, movement was started probably most recently during the George Bush Jr. uh, uh, administration when people were fleeing for their lives for deaths uh, from death squads. And uh, the idea of sending people back who had legitimate claims uh, of, uh, you know, fear of uh, their lives uh, was a major thing. And uh, here we are approximately 10 years later. And sometimes the uh, uh, fear of death uh, is still looming. And the idea of sending somebody back uh, is not necessarily the the most ethical thing to do. Well, David, I mean, I'm glad that you're not one of our elected officials, uh, because I think these are the decisions that we elect people to make Uh, at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day and all throughout the day. Honestly, uh, I'm not really here looking out for every single person on the planet. Right. Um, am I my brother's keeper? Sure. And as much as I can be right ethically, this is the United States of America. And we're, a, we're, a, a consortium of States. And if we elect Eric Adams or Kathy Hochul to be governor of New York or whomever, you know, or Joe Biden to be president, they have a responsibility to the constituents that elected them. Now, if someone comes from, I don't know, Venezuela and they come through I don't know, Colombia and make their way through Central America, through Nicaragua and Costa Rica and get to North America and they go through Mexico and they get to Texas. Uh, Now they're in Texas and they're like, hey, I was in Venezuela and I felt like Maduro was going to kill me. I'm in fear of my life. Somebody in the multitude of states they just mentioned should have said, well, as soon as you were out of that danger, you should have filed for asylum in the, the closest place in Colombia, in Mexico, in uh, Nicaragua, in, uh, I don't know, you name it, right? There was a, a, a bunch of places in between that they could have stopped and applied for asylum. But they what they wanted to do is become Americans, right? What they wanted to do was come here because this is the best option for them. So I don't know that um, the bleeding heart role works here where we can say because somebody's in fear of their life that all of a sudden we have to open the door to them. I mean, call me crass if you like. I I don't mind saying that. Um, I have no problem with that because I think it's not only our job. I think there are other people. Right now, if it's a Canadian or a Mexican and they're like, oh, my God, I fear for my life, then you say, hey, where else can you go? But uh, into Buffalo, New York, or into uh, Michigan, or into um, Arizona or or California, right? Those are the only options you have. Those are our immediate neighbors. The issue is, That's not what's happening. These people are not coming from uh, Mexico, per se. They're going straight through South America. They're coming through Central America. They're getting into North America, all through Mexico, all the way into uh, Texas. Now, that's presuming that these individuals that are coming from South America, but then there's all these people that are coming from China. There was a report that we played the other night that the majority, the fastest growing ethnic group coming in from anywhere is from China. So now we're going to say, oh, because things are bad in China, we have to open our doors for you. Doesn't China have other neighbors? So th- these are the things that, that, that come to mind for me. So um, may- maybe you're right. Maybe it's not ethical. Uh, but that's a, an unethical decision I'd be very comfortable to make because ultimately my responsibility is to my children in my home. So if there's an eight-year-old kid outside my door and death is knocking at my door, 
I have to make a choice between the eight-year-old kid outside and the eight-year-old kid inside my house, my own kid, who do you think I'm choosing? Obviously, I'm choosing my own kid. And of course, if I can do anything to save the other kid, I'm going to save the other kid if I can. But if my neighbor has a, a better opportunity to do that, then great. Then he should do it. And, and that's the point I'm making. It's not that these people who need help shouldn't be helped. It's that the responsibility shouldn't be solely placed upon the United States. Because as long as there's going to be problems in the world, we can't be the solution for that, where we have already agreed to take in more immigrants every year at a million a year than any other country on God's green earth. However, we take in now more. I think we're uh, six or seven times that amount, or at least uh, double or triple that amount. And that's not working out well for us. And it's not like that's happening. I mean, here's another example. People are, are up in arms about this happening in, in Gaza, right? Did the Egyptians uh, open the door? Did uh, Jordan open the door? Did anybody open the door to the folks trying to flee Gaza? Other than, is anybody helping them other than the Jews? The IDF, the Israelis. These are the questions that I would ask about what's ethical or what's not ethical. I think you, you, people do have some, not all, some responsibility to their immediate neighbors. I remember the Dominican Republic putting a, a military on their border when Haitians were trying to come in during a time of unrest. And I think it was a natural disaster. And they were just desperate to get out of, of Haiti and into the Dominican Republic. And they had to put their army there because they couldn't handle the influx of, of that type of immigration. It wasn't something they agreed to because ultimately you're in control of your front door, your back door, your side door. You control your property. You control yourself. That's what sovereignty is all about. And, and David, as much as I want to feel for others, I have to feel for us. I have to feel for the people that are here already. I have to feel for the people that waited online. And so many immigrant stories that I hear that they say, you know, we came in with a sponsor. And back then we had to pay 25000 a person. And now our government is giving people money. We're giving them a cell phone. We're giving them a debit card and, and multiple uh, months of payments at 1000 to 2200 a month on this debit card. And not to mention the seven months in a, in a hotel in New York City, you know. I, 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 I can't even stay at a hotel in New York City, at least not the ones they're staying at. These really nice ones. So while it's a good sentiment, and, uh, and I appreciate your thoughts and your call here, uh, ultimately, I think that we, we have to look after the, the folks that are here first before we can take care of anybody else. David. So how did you get your job there, uh, Rich? Uh, you uh, are stingy with freedom. And you think that uh, freedom is something that can be measured by uh, some kind of artificial standard. I mean, No, well, I, actually, I think our, our rights, our liberty comes from God. It's given from God, so it's given freely. Uh, I, I'm not giving it to anybody. I'm not stingy with it. I also know that uh, everything has order, right? Um, I live in a town. I have a mayor. There's a mayor in my town. If I call the cops, it's the cops from my town that are going to co come, not the cops from three towns over. So there's an order to everything, and um, that's the only way we can do things. Anyway, David, the music means I got to go, but thank you for your call and for your critique. Always appreciate it. Folks, we come back. Uh, more talk on the economy and more after this. Don't go anywhere. and thank you for everything. I know you very well and I have, I listen, but I have a lot of people that listen and they love your show and I appreciate it very much. America at Night with Rich Valdez. We made it so clear that we can't have the shutdown because it hurts so many people in so many different ways, even for a short period of time, was very apparent in the room and the speaker did not reject that. He said he wants to avoid a government shutdown. So that was very heartening. Now, there you have uh, Senator Chuck Schumer discussing the um, 
possibility, like we always talk about, this possibility of a shutdown. And it, it makes me think, you know, American taxpayers, uh, you and me, regular people, we can't just shut down our own economies, right? We just can't. Uh, people like me, I've been trying to save to buy a new place in uh, South Florida, and I'm stuck on the Jersey side of the Hudson River because I, I just can't afford it. Home prices keep going up. And while our government wants to continue to spend the money that they print and the money that they tax from us and potentially shut down because of uh, disagreements on how they spend it, it, it ultimately doesn't change how we're all hit with, uh, with the overall impact of the economy. So I want to get a, a cursory view of what's going on with our next guest, because I think this is ultimately like uh, the Raging Cajun said, it's the economy, stupid, right? This is one of those things that is really, really um, important to most voters. And up until recently, it was the number one issue. And it's only become the number two issue, second to immigration, which seems to be on a lot of people's minds. But I want to dig into this. So I want to welcome Aaron Hedlund, uh, former chief domestic economist and senior advisor at the White House Council of, of Economic Advisors. And he's with uh, America First now. Let's uh, welcome Aaron Hedlund. Thank you, sir. Glad to join you. So what's your take um, on the current state of affairs from a potential shutdown in Washington, D.C. to how things are hitting everybody in the pocketbook at home on Main Street? Well, I think the shutdown theatrics are not the biggest story. I mean, of course, it's important what happens there. But I think the broader context is look at how disastrous our fiscal picture is and how that's actually affecting people's real pocketbooks. Mm -hmm. What we saw during COVID and the aftermath of COVID is essentially a permanent expansion of government. You've seen spending go up dramatic, you know, essentially 20 plus percent discretionary spending. And we've seen deficits just from this past year compared to the year before that, essentially double, multi-trillion dollar deficits in a single year. And this kind of fire hose of money that's been kind of injected into the economy artificially was largely responsible for the 40-year high inflation that is still wrecking havoc on people's pocketbooks. Now, this is a problem because I think you've got some Republicans um, on the political side of things that are trying to get spending back to pre-COVID levels, Uh, only some Republicans. And then you have uh, some Democrats that want to continue to increase this um, permanent uh, increase in the size of government that you just talked about, or at least in spending. And I don't know that that gets reconciled anytime soon. But ultimately, everybody in between pays the price um, at at home in real life, whether it's home prices, food prices, and they're not all, uh, you know, tied to inflation per se. I think there's a number of things that go into the, the cost of food and a number of things that go into the cost of, of homes. But ultimately, I think inflation is the main culprit. Uh, would you agree with that? And if not, what else is causing these things to, to stay high? Yeah, I think it's really important to correct the record for your listeners compared to what they hear coming from the White House regarding mm-hmm. why we've had all these kind of this cost of living crisis that people are suffering from. And the reasoning really where it didn't come from Vladimir Putin. It didn't come from companies that suddenly decided they wanted to make money in spring of 2021. Companies have always wanted to make money, but we have a free market competition that sort of holds that at bay in terms of prices. But what we saw in spring of 2021 was an unprecedented set of policies that added trillions of dollars to the deficit when the economy had essentially recovered from COVID already, adding fuel to the inflation fire, and actively discouraging work and energy production. And the combination of those two things, artificial demand and kind of throttling back supply, that's what brought us the 40-year high inflation. That's the reason people's paychecks shrank in purchasing power by multiple thousands of dollars, and they haven't yet caught up from that. That's the reason why people right now, just to kind of stay afloat, are racking up literally record credit card debt with delinquencies on a very steep, rapid increase. So this is the thing people are suffering from, and it's really policy-induced. So with with the reckless policies of the Biden administration in view, um, does this does this mean we reverse those and we can get back on track or does this mean there's too much damage that's been done and the whole house of cards comes tumbling down? 
know, I fundamentally believe in the resilience of the U.S. economy and the millions of workers and small businesses that are out there. So I absolutely think the damage is reversible. That doesn't mean there's not damage. There certainly is. But I think if we can roll back the excessive spending, I think if we could return to pro-growth policies that really reassure people that they're going to be not penalized for their productive activity, uh, and we unleash the gates of energy, right, Go really pursue energy dominance, I think we can get to a better path. Because essentially, when you look at things like debt, which people have been talking about debt and deficits for a super long time, and I, I think like the average person doesn't really recognize, is it really that big of a deal since people have been talking about it forever? Well, it's, it's becoming a big deal, and we're seeing the effects of that via inflation. And now it's almost like a, a runaway train because you have the combination of really high debt and high interest rate. So we need to get our economy growing faster. That that helps with that burden right there. And then also not spending at the pace we are. Well, I want to talk about spending a little more, but I also want to just uh, get your take on the, um, the stuff that's in the news, right? And there's some news about the cost of homes. National home price uh, seems to be up 5.5% nationally uh, in December. And I guess those numbers just came out um, on Tuesday, and which is earlier today. And And this is... Uh, from what I'm reading, up 5% from where it was a month ago. So my, my thought here is why, um, if people have less money and everything is is more scarce, why, why are homes costing more? Is this because they're have increased in value? Is it because they know you, you, you just have to pay more for a mortgage, so you're just going to have to pay more for a house, uh, or, or is there more to it? Well, it used to be the case, and, and still fundamentally this is true, that when interest rates go up, that should actually dampen prices because people right. don't have as much purchasing power to buy the house. But what's really peculiar with this whole episode is that mortgage rates went up so quickly, and that again happened because the Federal Reserve had to take action to combat the inflation that was created by the reckless fiscal policy. And what happened is that causes buyers to have not as much purchasing power to buy as much as they want to. But what you've really seen is that a lot of homeowners are just sitting on the sidelines. They locked in 3% rates, 3.5% rates, and they have no intention of selling anytime soon. And because there's so little inventory, there's so little supply, that has largely prevented prices from falling in the way that they would normally do in that circumstance, in the way that they did in the mid-late 2000s when you had interest rates go up. Uh, it's just kind of a very unusual circumstance to have really low rates, and then suddenly they go up to be pretty high rates. Yeah, and I, I think you're probably um, um, onto something there. And uh, I'm always very skeptical of whether the large institutional investors are buying up the little bit of inventory that's available in the single-family uh, residence uh, market, and and if that's also driving up the the cost of homes with, I, I think, some of the larger banks or financial organizations that are out there uh, are quickly becoming um, the, the biggest landlords, if you will. Do you think that's also playing a role, or is that just circumstance or happenstance because of what's going on? So I, th- I think that could be playing a minor role, but I don't think that's the, the major player or even close to it. I mean, those institutional players are really only acting in certain markets. They're usually trying to buy a whole bunch of properties um, in a concentrated area. They're not kind of going scattershot, getting a house there, a house here. Uh, So I think they do have some effect, but even if you took them out of the picture, I think fundamentally you'd be seeing price dynamics that are pretty similar to what we're seeing now. That's fair. Aaron Hedlund is the former chief domestic economist and senior advisor at the White House Council of Economic Advisors. He's with the America First Policy Institute now. We're discussing the economy. I want to talk about spending and more when we come back. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. America at Night with Rich Valdez. Five of us, the president, the vice president, Leader McConnell, Speaker, uh, Leader Jeffries, and myself, made it so clear 
how vital this was to the United States. This was so, so important. And that we couldn't afford to wait a month or two months or three months because we, we would, in all likelihood, lose the war. NATO would be fractured at best. Allies would turn away from the United States. Now that's Senator Chuck Schumer. Now he's not talking about providing relief for for uh, burdened taxpayers, for people that are suffering from inflation, for American citizens and taxpayers. No, no, no. He's talking about getting billions and billions of dollars in aid to Ukraine because we might just lose the war because we might. Then listen, I don't take my comments uh, as flippant. I think that we do need to win in Ukraine and I think there needs to be a strategy and I don't think we should abandon them. I also don't think we should be doling out uh, that kind of money to the to tune that we have, uh, because ultimately government spending has been the root, right? Uh, the root of, of our inflation problem. And, and that's what I want to talk about uh, with our guest, Aaron Hedlund. He's a former chief domestic economist and senior advisor at the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, he's also with uh, America First Policy Institute. And Aaron Hedlund, when you hear about all of this spending that's going on, uh, continued spending for, for Ukraine, and knowing full well that this type of spending, whether it's in the name of COVID, in the name of Ukraine, in the name of anything else, that this type of government spending is what puts us in the precarious situation that we're in, uh, known as inflation. Uh, how do you react to that? Well, it's really, it's like playing an old record again and again. I mean, the only thing the left knows how to do is spend. Like yeah. You talk about p- p- pick your policy issue. Their solution is, well, the government has to spend more. Right. There's never a discussion of how do you reform Fix a program or, so, or end a program that's not working. There's, there's no strategy on how to win. It's just, well, I got some more money at it. And then when, that, when they do that and it doesn't work, then the solution is even more money. And what we get in exchange for that is a lot of debt and then inflation. And, and this is why people aren't happy about the economy. So when the White House acts perplexed about, well, how, why aren't people cheering all this great news? Bottom line, their incomes after you adjust for inflation are down. When people feel, feel poorer, they're not going to be happy. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and I think that this is just one area, Ukraine and, and, and Israel and other you know, military spending, foreign aid. But there's also an area of spending that I think is um, going unnoticed because it's being overshadowed by the crime that's accompanied with it, which is uh, illegal immigration. There's a, a lot going on there from the reporting that I've heard of on this program with people that are on the ground in different places. Uh, people coming across the border are not only getting an airline ticket and wherever they want to go, but they're ultimately given a cell phone and a debit card with a thousand to twenty two hundred dollars on it. And it's refillable for several months. They're they're able to stay in shelters for, I think, up to seven months. And all of this is either, you know, uh, federal or state dollars. And most of it's all federal. And and then they even have uh, non-governmental organizations that are helping, quote unquote, helping with this process. And 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 they're getting uh, grant money from this. And and I'm thinking to myself. How much of this can our country withstand, and, and what's the economic impact for all of us? Yeah, I mean, the lawlessness on the border is, is so extreme that incompetence doesn't even really tell the full story. I mean, there has to be some deliberate nature to this in terms of why, why the administration is not actually enforcing the border. I mean, that's how bad it is. They're essentially encouraging this. Mm-hmm. And it's not to the benefit of anybody. I mean, not only are American citizens suffering from this, there's the crime, there's the fiscal expense, there's all sorts of, again, monetary and non-monetary costs. It's also a humanitarian crisis at the border because you've got coyotes and people that are taking advantage and trafficking that's happening. So there's absolutely no reason why this should be happening. We, we need to have law and order. And I think the left, in, in some sick way, they figure, well, Let's get them all here, and once they're here, we're, they're, they're here forever. And uh, I, don't, I don't think the American people buy that. Oh, I don't either. But um, I'm wondering, um, what, they're here, and it, it's not a short-term economic impact. It's a long-term one. Do, do you think, I mean, I keep hearing of schools that are overburdened and, and hospital systems, but overall, uh, economically speaking, what type of impact does having 7 million new people in the country that 
from what I understand, they don't even need to go and apply for any type of um, assistance. They're they're getting it as they come in. Uh, how does this affect our spending? Is, is, is it something that we can withstand? Uh, I would presume no, but what say you? Well, it depends what you mean by can withstand. I mean, we do have a very strong country with a lot of economic power. And even though we've been diminished, there's, you know, we're not going to fold up and fail because of it. But it's certainly causing harm, right? We, that's, mm-hmm. Our leaders are supposed to be looking out for our welfare. And you're absolutely right. You've got schools that are overrun and social services that are stretched and policed that are pulled in, in various directions. And uh, it, it's, it, is, it is an astounding cost that we need to deal with. And it just boggles the mind why it continues like this. And, and clearly it's just going to require a change of leadership to, to adjust that policy. What area of spending would you say is the number one area that we need to to reduce, um, given the the current policies that are coming out of Washington? Well, I'd say, first of all, big picture, just for, so people, your listeners, have in mind the scale. We've had essentially more than a twenty percent increase in discretionary spending after adjusting for inflation since just twenty nineteen. Right, so this is a pretty big expansion of government. That's happened in a number of different areas, but a lot of it has been what the administration at one point was calling human infrastructure, which is really just their rebranding. They love rebranding. They like coming up with solutions, but they like to rebrand things uh, of basically social welfare spending. Right? So they've expanded all sorts of programs essentially to encourage government dependency. And it's because they have a totally different view of the connection between work and consumption. Right. They think those things can be separated, where somehow you, you should be able to buy certain things and have a certain living standard and have that be disconnected from work because work is sort of a bad thing in their mind. And they get what they pay for in the sense that you actually do get reductions in people wanting to work and reductions in labor supply and people who end up going to the sidelines instead of being able to kind of live up to their, their full capabilities. And I think if we were to address those programs kind of – rewind some of the expansion, but then also figure out how to modernize those programs, mm-hmm. we could get a lot more kind of bang for our buck. And- Aaron Hedlund, former chief domestic economist and senior advisor at the White House. I want to thank you for being with us. We're out of time on this segment, but you are a gentleman, a scholar, and a patriot, and I really appreciate it. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, America, welcome back, amigos. Again, uh, make sure you check out Aaron Hedlund, uh, chief economist over at the America First Policy Institute. Excellent information. I'm glad he was with us. And, you know, it it really helps me uh, frame things as I think about what's going on, as I see articles like the Army's cutting 24,000 troops in a major restructuring. And I think, wow, we're cutting military spending, uh, but we're not cutting Ukraine spending. Uh, We're we're not cutting spending at the border or other social programs. These are problematic questions. Uh, But yet there's plenty of money for diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's plenty of money for um, those programs that exclude whites. And we're going to learn a little bit more about that in a little while. And again, I'm not an apologist for whites, but shoot, I mean, if we're not going to be racist, we're not going to be racist, right? We shouldn't be excluding anyone. Anyway, more to come straight ahead. I'm Rich Valdez. From the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez. America's favorite late night talk program. Featuring interesting guests from around the world. And calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez.
Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome back. It's hour number two. If you're uh, coming back, thank you. If you're just joining us, welcome. Our phone number, if you want to join our late-night national town hall conversations, 833-482-5337. And there's a number of things going on in the news tonight. Of course, uh, Nikki Haley was humiliated again in the Michigan primary, as I read some headlines from the Bajino Report. Uh, You've got uh, the Biden administration telling Israel to not prevent Hamas from stealing aid. And you've got uh, the court now blocking 800,000 non-citizens from voting in New York City. And this is a a good thing as it uh, deals a big blow to Democrats hoping that they would uh, be able to have non-citizens voting in municipal elections. And Google lost $70 billion in market value after their Gemini AI system was exposed as a, a fraud. Right. It's it's um, it's a racist <laughs> system. We've seen it all. And this is pretty funny. Uh, I mean, again, you would put pictures of George Washington. They would show you pictures of an African-American man. And, and again, um, George Washington Carver, perhaps uh, George Washington, not so much. And it, it just it was it, it's interesting to see how their influence uh, on diversity and equity and inclusion uh, affects the A.I. so much that it literally was giving a bunch of falsehoods. But this is where we are. And it's this racism, it's these falsehoods that I think are affecting so much of of everything, right? Whether it's AI, whether it's a curriculum in your kid's school, whether it's the the policy at your um, company, everybody's dealing with this one way or another. And a lot of well-intentioned people, I think, end up, uh, sipping that Kool-Aid where they think it's a good idea. Um, you know, in my own life, um, I'm dealing with something outside of work, um, some like volunteerism that I'm involved in. And there are people that are just so focused on trying to be politically correct that they don't mind offending everybody else on the way to protecting uh, a certain group of people. And it's almost like it's now it's preferential uh, you also have some people who may misbehave in the workplace in a separate part of my uh, personal life. Somebody I know in their workplace had some people that weren't holding their end of, of the job. And when they were spoken to saying, hey, look, you've got to do X, Y, and Z, they turned around and said, so-and-so is picking on me because I'm of a particular race. And there's so much emphasis on this because it's in the media every single day that people are afraid now to even approach these situations. And those that know where fear is present, uh, present, they can smell that fear and will exploit that fear and do whatever they want. And it just it's a catch-22, right? You're just creating opportunities for more bad behavior. And in on the extreme of it and on the other side of it, you're just creating opportunities for things that shouldn't be. And they're wrong. And this is uh, such the case, in my opinion, that's happening with a school district that was offering a white attendees only classroom. Now, if you're going to have an event or a school district offering where you can say that uh, only white attendees come or only black attendees come, uh, I I think all this is not um, very inclusive. Right. And this is part of the problem. Now, if you're doing the the white attendees only because there's already a black attendees only, well, uh, m- maybe there's a conversation we can have. But I think ultimately everything should be together, right? I mean, at least in my mind, my very simple mind, I'm going to say, because it seems that today everybody has a different view of how these things should go. Well, such is the case uh, with Parents Defending Education, who's filed a a civil rights complaint with the United States Department of Education against uh, Middletown Cross Plains Area School District in Wisconsin for discrimination on the basis of race and national origin programs that receive federal assistance. Because I'll remind everyone that doing such, these uh, discriminatory practices and being exclusionary uh, based on race, is, last I checked, is a federal crime, right? It's, uh, it's not lawful. So... Middleton is um, offering one particular affinity group, 
certain programming that is only open to students of certain races. And participation in the Witnessing Whiteness Affinity Group is restricted based on race. Specifically, Middleton's a Director of Student, Family, and Staff Engagement emphasizes that the affinity space is meticulously crafted for white individua- uh, individuals and is only available for white attendees. And uh, I find this interesting. So we're going to learn a little bit more about it uh, with our guest, who is from PDE, Parents uh, Defending Education. Carolyn Moore is the vice president at PDE, and she's our guest. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me on. Oh, it's my pleasure. So help us uh, understand a little bit about what's going on with the school district in Wisconsin. Why are they creating a class for whites only? You know, I think that's a very good question. As you've mentioned, it's unconstitutional, unlawful, and discriminatory in nature. So these types of things shouldn't exist. Affinity groups, for those of your listeners who aren't aware, they're supposed to be groups that take place during a homeroom or a free period where kids gather around a common interest. So maybe a drama club or a science club or a debate club. That's that's what affinity groups were like when I was going to school. Now we see in states all over the country, not just in California, like this one is in um, Wisconsin, we see that there are these affinity groups that are specifically targeting certain students based on their race, which is unconstitutional because we want all students to be exposed to diversity of thought and ideas and persons. Um, when they're going to public school, that's the benefit of public school is that kids are exposed to kids for other kids from all other backgrounds. So sure. every kid should be able to go to every club and, you know, go to a STEM program and everyone should be able to go to a science class. Whereas this, this, um, this particular affinity group, like you mentioned, um, is called witnessing whiteness. And it is an affinity group that just specifically targets white students It's a 10-week course where students, a group of, they said they don't want more than 20 students, so 20 white kids are in this, you know, program, and they read a book, and they are taught to believe, um, to see the world through that lens of oppressor and oppressed, Um, and you're putting people in specific categories, which is, of course, terrible, but um, it's teaching these white children that their background is bad, that they should, you know, feel bad about who they are as human beings. And they, you know, nobody chooses what they're born as. Um, That's just the way the world is. And they said that a specific um, purpose of this group is to build a community with share to to understand a shared grasp of privilege. So these kids are supposed to sit in a group for 10 weeks, read a book about how terrible they are, and then try to reorient themselves in a world that says that they're terrible. Um, And, you know, there's definitely terrible things about, you know, kids shouldn't be separated based on the color of their skin. And these, these groups should not exist. Every student should be able to go to this. If this is a, Um, affinity group, witnessing whiteness. You know what? If anyone wants to go to that group, they should be able to go. But should we really have groups like this anyway? I think that um, that kind of brings us into question. And so that's why we filed a, a federal complaint with the Department of Education, because we think that, you know, it, these affinity groups, I mean, they need to be open to all students. But also, if these types of affinity groups exist in a school, I think that the, this is just a symptom of a larger issue mm-hmm. about problematic, you know, trainings that the teachers may be required to go to that we don't know about. And so the purpose of filing these complaints is, you know, creating a situation where it, you know, the Department of Education, they see a red flag and they have to um, look into it. Whether they do a full on investigation is a different story. But that's why we try to publicize um, any of these complaints we file, because by exposing it, you, you know, put pressure on school districts and school districts are not used to having pressure put on them. 
especially yeah. like before I filed this, I hadn't thought much about Middleton Cross Plains Area School District in Middleton, Wisconsin. You know, most people <laughs> aren't thinking that, you know, a, a, a school district right outside of Madison is that bad. You know, you're thinking like mm-hmm. downtown Chicago is terrible or Detroit is terrible or New York City. People aren't thinking that these are ha- this is happening everywhere. But uh, unfortunately, that's what we found, that this is happening in red states and blue states and in rural districts and in urban ones. And it seems like, you know, um, states, um, whether it's the unions or the activists or the state superintendents, are, you know, pressuring school districts into adopting strange policies that, you know, value equity over equality and merit. Um, and affinity groups seem to be one of those things um, that we come across frequently, whether people um, send us anonymous tips or um, we find it through open records requests. But affinity groups seem to be where there are a lot of separating children based on the color of their skin, which is very scary. Folks, we're on with Caroline Moore, Vice President of Parents Defending Education, discussing uh, their uh, federal civil rights complaint against the school district in Wisconsin, um, Middleton, that is offering a whites-only course called Witnessing Whiteness, uh, where I'm going to suppose, my words, not hers, that they're going to tell these white kids how bad they are and how, uh, how, how they or their parents are oppressors and how they could change that. Uh, to not be so oppressive. And uh, I'm sure I'm not off by much here. Anyway, we're going to learn more about this uh, lawsuit and uh, what PDE does as a whole when we come back with our guest, Caroline Moore. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, amigos, welcome back, familia. We continue our conversation on this federal lawsuit uh, over white kids being put into a whites-only class, segregation, if you will. And the title of the course, Witnessing Whiteness, it's uh, euphemized as an affinity group, but it's restricted on race. Caroline uh, Moore is the vice president of defending uh, parents, defending education. And Caroline, tell us a little bit about what uh, parents defending education does overall. Oh, absolutely. So parents defending education is a nonprofit. Um, We have staff all over the country. We're all remote. And why we do that is so that we can focus on problems that are happening across the country. So we have members, representative of all states, and we track parent groups in each state. We're specifically interested in parental rights in schools. And so we want to build the relationship back to, you know, how it used to be where parents and teachers work together to have their students succeed, graduate from high school, you know, read at grade level be able to do multiplication and contribute it positively into the workplace or go on to college. So that's really our focus. And by doing that, we, we get anonymous tips. We have people who file open records requests with districts. So if a parent um, is maybe concerned with what's going on in their school district or has come across a, you know, a principal or a teacher and doesn't really know how to navigate um, working with them. They think that, you know, the district's hiding things from them. They can reach out to us and say, you know, I live in X district and I either want to talk through, you know, how I should handle a situation. We have tons of tips for how parents can navigate um, school board meetings with, you know, sounding you know, like they know what's going on and, um, you know, putting their thoughts together in a way that they'll be taken seriously. 
um, because we know that in the past, since COVID, a lot of parents have not been taken seriously. They've been called mm-hmm. domestic terrorists and all, all sorts right. of things. So we want to give parents a toolkit to, you know, advocate um, the best they can for their child. And I primarily deal with things on the legal end. I'm not a lawyer, but I have had the privilege of working with lawyers my entire <laughs> working career. So I'm, I call myself an honorary lawyer. So mm-hmm. I work with our lawyers to figure out whether things meet a certain threshold, like for instance, this Middleton Cross Plains Area School District, this isn't necessarily a lawsuit, um, but we think that this that there are problems here. And so the right course of action, and parents don't have the time to file these complaints, I um, go ahead and file the complaints with the Department of Education to kind of um, cover or create um, a paper trail of bad districts. Because the Department of Education, by statute, has to investigate these districts. So parents don't have time to do that. Parents don't have time to um, file open records requests with their districts to figure out about these affinity groups or figure out, you know, um, if classes are discriminatory or kids are being taught oppressor, oppressor. Um, So kind of we're here to to do the things that parents don't have time to do. So I file um, our civil rights complaints. And then sometimes we run across school districts that are so bad that the only they meet the threshold of a lawsuit. And um, those are usually free speech issues. If a student is being required um, to use pronouns in a classroom or if their um, rights or speech are being violated in the classroom, um, then we, you know, if it meets a specific threshold, then we file lawsuits. And we, we do that because, um, you know, if an entire school district, if there are so many parents and so many students that are impacted terribly by these policies, you know, they really can't advocate for themselves. And um, it affects their daily life in school. And so we just want everybody to be able to go to school and learn, you know, math, science, English, and history, and not have to worry about all this, you know, social indoctrination and political stuff in the classroom. And so that's kind of, um, that's a little bit of background on what we do. And if folks want to learn more about the work that you're doing or they want to follow you on social media, how do they get in touch and how do they keep up the speed with your work? Oh, yeah. Great question. So defendinged.org is our website. Um, we have lots of great tool, tools on there for parents. Um, one thing that I always point to, I, I think it's really one of our best resources, is we have a, a list of school districts across the country that have parental exclusion policies. Um, and so that's a great resource for parents. Um, or else our anonymous um, tip email is info at Is that all available on the website at defendinged.org? Yep. All right. Well, I'll, we'll send everybody there. Defendinged.org. Caroline Moore, VP of Parents Defending Education. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. You bet. Folks, we're coming right back. Don't go anywhere. I'm going to With Rich Valdez. So there's the survey out, and it says that a surprising number of managers um, want sick employees to come to work. We'll get into that in a little bit. But what I want to talk about right now is how 41% of U.S. employees are looking for another job. And I think the reason for that is because more than half of college graduates are currently working in jobs that don't require a degree. So this means that college education, or at least the degree that comes with it, may not be as effective as it was. Now, we talked a little bit about this last night, and the, um, the consensus was, at least my consensus, was that I think education is always going to be valuable. Whether the question is now, is it worth what you're paying for it? Has it reached the point of diminishing returns or not? 
And that's what we're going to explore uh, with Mike Thompson. He's the CEO of Learner Mobile, LearnerMobile.com. And Mike Thompson, welcome, sir. Hey, Rich. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. You bet. Thanks for staying up late. Hope you had some coffee. I've got a lot of questions. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Let's dig into this a little bit because I think that it's it's interesting to me. And again, I don't have a point of reference. Uh, You know, I can't say, you know, in 1980, uh, it was this percentage of Americans that, um, you know, had a degree versus uh, those that are without a degree working in, in the same field. And when I see this number here, more than half of Americans who earned college degrees find themselves working in jobs that don't require a degree or utilize the skills that they acquired in the pursuit of that degree. Uh, I, I think to myself, is that the fault of the consumer, a.k.a. the student? Is that the fault of the industry? You know, wh- where did the change happen? Or is it is it just um, a combination of everything? Or, you know, is the degree still valuable, the education still valuable, but not as valuable as people banked on? Uh, where do you land on that? Yeah, I think it's D, Rich. It's all of the above, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think everybody is has some share of the blame in this, but I, I believe it starts with the value proposition of what college colleges and four-year institutions claimed. It wasn't that long ago that there was this easy to understand value proposition. And it was basically an agreement between the student, the, the college or university and the employer. And basically that agreement said that if you come to our college and you study hard and you apply yourself, you're going to get a degree. And then the employers are going to have a great job waiting for you in the end. And that was a value proposition that I think a lot of us could get behind, but that is no longer the value proposition. There's not necessarily this great job waiting for you at the end. And that value proposition has become messy and cluttered and a little bit confusing. And so that's, I I think we're in that state today and uh, colleges are trying to figure out what is that, what is that value proposition? And people who are considering colleges want to know the same thing. I think that's a really good way of putting it. Um, and, and that was what I was talking about, that point of diminishing returns. Like it was, it's a really right, great value right. proposition if it's 20 grand total for four years, <laughs> right? When it's yeah. 20 grand a semester or, you know, 20, even 20 grand a year in some cases, um, it, it still may be too much. And it, yeah. the question is, are you going to ask your kid or parents or a combination uh, thereof to mortgage their future on, um, on this education if it's not getting them in the door. And, and where I've landed, and I worked for about eight years as a uh, director of admissions for a small four-year school. So my, my take on this was always the following. Uh, a, I only worked with adult students in the capacity I had. So these were people that were already working, and they were like, I make 70 grand a year, but in order for me to make 110, I need a bachelor's degree. They knew what they were getting, yeah. and the, the value proposition right. was there for them. But for everybody else, my, my, my take was always, you know, make sure it's there. Make sure this makes sense for you. If it makes sense for you, great. If not, not. <laughs> it's that simple. Yeah. I don't think it's for everyone. I think education may be for everyone, but not necessarily the formal uh, expense and training of the education. And I think we could all learn about lots of things. Um, I have a, a very avid interest in, in, in uh, psychology. And uh, I, I doubt I would ever go to school for psychology because I don't want to be a professional psychologist. And, and I think it's important that people realize, you know, those things about themselves. You know, how much do I want to learn about sure. something? And is it a YouTube video from a, a recognized expert versus, uh, you know, a college course, degree, certificate, diploma, whatever? And and I think that's part of the conversation that we're having. Folks, I want to remind you, we're on with Mike Thompson. He is the CEO of Learner Mobile. And we're discussing, is college still worth it? And I I guess the answer is for some, right? If you want to become a nurse or you want to become an engineer, you have no choice but to pursue that that degree, right? If you want to become a a doctor or a lawyer, these are prerequisites. But some careers just don't require that anymore. And I think Google was one of the the first companies out there that I remember uh, saying, we're not necessarily looking for a college degree. We want certifications in certain areas and experience and this and that and the other. 
And and I think they kind of paved the way to go back to something that existed way back when, when people really looked at your experience. And do you think that's making a comeback uh, that people are now valuing experience or is it just people don't care so much about college? No, I, I think you you're spot on rich. And, you know, I, I, I don't know if you're like me, but when I was considering college at college, my parents both said, it's not an option. You're going to college. And <laughs> at that time, yeah. And, and so, so I, I knew that that was the expectation and I was going to college, whether I wanted to or not, I'm like you, I told my kids the same exact thing. I said, I said, college is it. You got, you got to go to college to get a good job. I think my parents were, you know, they, they, they had good intentions of course, but I don't know that they were 100% accurate. I certainly was not, but what, what that those conversations and that push from our parents drove is that everyone felt like they had to go to college. And so the applicant numbers went sky high, the, the number of students attending colleges went up. And, and so of course the tuition is going to go up, the debt's going to go up and, and you start to have this ROI problem. The, the challenge that happened is when all of this went up, we found ourselves graduating students that just weren't ready for the workforce. Uh, what employers were expecting from people graduating from college was they, they were, these students were, were somewhat fallen short. Uh, they didn't have the skill. They didn't have the trade. They may have had the ability to learn how to learn, but they fell short in just the aptitude to, to do the job. Yeah, being able and to so deliver. with mounting, yeah. And then all of this, all this mounting debt and the baggage that came along with that. And, and, and that's where we are today. It's the culmination of everybody feeling like they've got to go to college, rising costs. And what I think is really important is college is great to your point for the right person, the right fit, the right pursuit. College though, isn't necessarily for everybody. It's okay not to go to college there are a lot of pathways for success uh, today. Yeah, uh, listen, I'm, I'm totally with you. And, and uh, this was something I, uh, I told my kids uh, early on, you know, like their entire lives, you got to go to college. I don't care what you do, what you do, how you do, but you got to go. And right, they did. Right. But when it came time for it, uh, they both were like, I don't want to go away and I don't know where I want to go and I don't know what I want to study. Yeah, and, yeah. and and I was like, you know, honestly, like a cartoon, like I was turning red, smoke was coming out of my ears. I was like, I've been telling you this since you were born. How, what do you mean? You don't right. know you're 17 right. years old. And, and, you know, I was, I was losing it, but I realized best thing that ever could have happened. Uh, both of my kids, uh, one's attending, one already went to community college and then transferred to a four year saving, you know, 50% sure. of the cost of that four year. So that plan. even if yeah. it's something that they study for the sake of, of, of studying or just learning for the sake of learning, and it isn't sure. what they end up dedicating themselves to. Um, at least they're only spending half of it. So I guess I'm somewhere yeah. in between on this. Uh, I, I Only recently when I realized that this change happened, and I, it, it happened in my lifetime. And I, I just want to squeeze out this thought before we take the break and we'll come back. But uh, it, it was, I remember being a young man in my 20s and, and wanting to grow within the, I worked for a Fortune 10 company at the time. And there was nowhere for me to go without a bachelor's degree. And I remember, you know, going to school to, to finish this degree. And and it was like, okay, great. Now I can have some opportunities. And then I realized, man, this stuff is really expensive. And they're also teaching me things that I don't want to know. Like, uh, you know, not like it is today with the wokeness and the indoctrination, but it was the beginning right, of that right. in the early 2000s. Right. And it was really more like um, stifling my religious beliefs and things like that. And, and I thought to myself, I don't like this school anymore. I was at NYU. And, and yeah. I, th I thought to myself, you know what, this isn't worth it. I'll go somewhere else. And I ended up never going anywhere else and um, just working. And my experience carried me, you know, to, to where I am today. But I think that that's an exception to the rule, or at least it felt like it at the time. I think it's not so much the case anymore. I think there are opportunities for people uh, with experience that don't necessarily have a degree, as long as it's not something that ends up with like professional licensure, like, you know, nursing or engineering or 
or a medicine or anything like that. So I want to get your take as the CEO of Learner Mobile. We're going to learn a little bit more about Learner Mobile as well. And uh, get your take on a couple of other uh, employment topics as well. Folks, stick around. We're on with Mike Thompson. He's the CEO of Learner Mobile, and we're coming right back. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, Familia, welcome back. We continue our discussion on is college still worth it? And when you have employment scenarios today where managers are asking more and more employees to come to work sick because they just they can't deal with that. And uh, honestly, that's the work ethic I came from. I know people hated it. Don't come here sick. You'll get everybody sick. But I was like, man, I'm not using my sick days for you, you know. (laughs) <laughs> I guess call me selfish, but that's, that's how it was. We, we didn't take sick days. You know, you, you work through everything. And and that seems to be the case again now that we're post-COVID. I think people are a little less sensitive to that. Uh, we also have the, um, the fact that a lot of people are in uh, school and they're getting out of school and they're not working in their field. And you've got 40% of the people that are currently working are looking for another job this year if they don't get additional training from their companies. And I feel like people might... Um, be um, warranted in in this um, desire that they have to learn more, but you don't really get to pick and choose as much, right? I don't know that there's that many opportunities out there. Well, to, to put a finer point on this, we're going to speak with Mike Thompson. He is the CEO of Learner Mobile. Mike Thompson, welcome back. And in the time we have remaining, I want to get your thoughts on these things. Um, What's your your take on on this idea that people are looking for more training and if they don't get it, they're leaving? Yeah, I I don't think it's uncommon. I I'm I, I know that the number is forty one percent of people who are are considering leaving if they don't get trained. I'm probably a little surprised that it's not even higher than that because you know really what we've got is we've got a modernized workforce today. The, the challenge is, and, and by what I mean by modernized workforce is they're digitally savvy. They operate at a crazy speed of business. Businesses are more complex and global than they've ever been. Decisions are made faster. Um, there's, there's lots of things that make up this modern worker. The problem is that the learning aspect of it, the training aspect of it has not kept up we still see a lot of companies operating in a traditional training environment or a traditional teaching environment. And so what I think has got to happen is these companies have got to modernize to meet the modern or to meet the needs of the modern worker. And there's really rich, there's really no excuse for companies today because it wasn't that long ago where Training was just so expensive because it required people to hop on a plane from lots of different cities around the world, fly to corporate headquarters or to some training center, stay for four days. And when they were there for four days, they certainly weren't in front of the customer. And so there was a lot of cost and a lot of lack of productivity. Well, that's just not the case today. Today, there's technology enablement that digitizes the training, uh, puts it in on-demand, bite-sized, just-in-time form that is easily deployable to a large and broad audience at a low cost. And guess what? People love that kind of training because it it accommodates their unique learning style. It's learner-centric. It's individualized for them. And they get to learn in the flow of their work. And it's it's not expensive anymore and the technology allows for it so companies really have no excuse not to be training for their uh, their workforce today because i think the resources are there yeah and you know honestly i a i think you make a good point and b um the companies i've worked for 
even the stuff you don't want to learn about, they're forcing you to learn about a bunch of stuff anyway, yeah. right? There's a yeah. bunch of trainings. I'm like, I could do without that, but they make oh, gosh. take it anyway, yeah. right? So if they can do that and it's all online and watch this video and take this test and print out this certificate, then of course you can do it on things that actually will help to add to everybody's sure. mutual bottom line. And right. you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, your unique position as the CEO of Learner Mobile. Um, well, actually, let me pause that question for when we come back because we're up against the break and I want to make sure you have enough time to answer the question and let everybody know how they could learn more about Learner Mobile. So folks, stick around. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, Learner Mobile and we're on with their CEO, Mike Thompson. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Valdez. All right, with two minutes to go till they kick us out, we're going to have a quick discussion with Mike Thompson about Learner Mobile. He's the CEO there. And during the break, I was taking a look at the website, and I'm not one to give too many free plugs, but I'll tell you, it's a really good site you've got here. Um, you have basically designed a platform for small businesses or businesses of any size. Uh, to, to scale their training program and put whatever they want in their training program uh, for uh, a very, very low cost. Tell us about it. Yeah, so we support large, small, mid-sized organizations all over the world. And, uh, you know, we, to your point, we, we've been able to just lower the cost because what's important for us is just to drive the reach and scale so that companies can reach their entire workforce Training has always been something that's fairly expensive, and therefore it was left for the director level and up, and we failed to meet the needs of the field-based worker. So what our attention is focused on is all levels within an organization. So, Rich, I, I come from the advertising industry. Thanks for the compliments on the website. Yeah. Uh, you know, for, for us in the, in the advertising industry at the time before I, I started uh, Learner Mobile, is work with Procter and Gamble, work with Coca-Cola, work with Walmart, and just learned a lot from them as far as advertising is all about behavior change. And that meant that you've got to drive the knowledge, the value proposition, but also the emotion. And mm -hmm. in the training world, uh, we thought it was all about academic rigor. And so when I, when I started uh, SVI and Learner Mobile, it was about let's not forget the emotion. It's right. all about behavior Ultimately, change. Ultimately, and, and not to cut you off, but, but that's what yeah, everybody buys, right. right? They buy emotion, and they buy people that they like. And uh, I think most people like you. Folks, we're on with the CEO of Learner Mobile. The music means they're kicking us out of here. Mike Thompson, I want to thank you for being with us. And uh, great luck with this business. It looks like it's a great thing. Actually, I'm thinking of creating a course. A lot of people ask me for something. Uh, I might be in touch. Anyway. You are a gentleman, a scholar, and a patriot. I thank you for being here, and we'll be right back with Open Phone America. Don't go anywhere. Live from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to hour number three of the program. We're live, we're national, and your calls are welcome. 833 4825 3378 valdez 
And uh, tonight we've discussed a, a number of things. Trump has won the uh, Michigan primary. Uh, that comes as no surprise at this point. And, and somebody, I heard somebody reporting on a uh, financial news network. I don't remember which one. I was at my bank. So I, I want to say it might have been CNBC, but it could have been, you know, the Wall Street Journal channel or something like that. Something I don't typically watch um, and I don't uh, hear of often. So anyway, the point is the guy's reporting and he's he's making the case that the markets uh, are are responding to this uh, historic achievement of Trump. And I'm thinking, what? How do you make the connection? Uh, but he was talking about how in the history of the country, there hasn't been. Uh, and I don't know if he's right or wrong. I want to fact check him on this. But it was an interesting statement that he made about the percentages that Trump is winning these primaries by that. He's, it's a sweep. He's really uh, sweeping it up. Um, it's one of the biggest. Um, I think he said the biggest percentage that uh, any any candidates ever had in the history of a presidential run. And I thought, wow, if that's the case, you know, there should probably be more stories about that. But it's not the case. Uh, Instead, we have reporting on other things like how we can eliminate um, issues like population, right? We can eliminate population, um, not having more children, because having children is the equivalent of slavery. Now, as a parent, I can say, I'm sure there's a lot of parents that feel that way at times that, you know, you can't go on a good vacation until your kids are old enough to travel out out of diapers and, you know, where they can sleep or they're not cranky. You're talking seven or six or seven years old, maybe. Um, And and certain places that you want to go to, you can't even go until they're 18 because they're not kid type of destinations. Like, you know, I just took a trip with my um, my my little girl who's 18 and uh, it was a great time. You know, in Puerto Rico, the drinking age is 18. So she had her first pina colada. Um, I told the bartender to take it easy on the alcohol. So hopefully he didn't put much of the uh, the Puerto Rican rum in there. But and I think I drank half of it, to be honest with you. But the point of my story is that there are certain things that come with child rearing. So I could see how somebody being um, jaded or somebody trying to be snide in some way could say, oh, my gosh, this is like I'm being a slave to my kid. But eventually your kids become self-sufficient. But Joy Reid from MSNBC, she's saying that having more children is akin to slavery. And she put this in a video response to none other than the pro-life senator, Tommy Tuberville. Listen to Joy Reid. The United States has a population of north of 327 million people. Why do we need more kids? I mean, your party, Senator Tuberville, is the one screaming that 10 million. Wow. Absolute insanity. Why do we need more kids? Now, I'm sure she's speaking tongue in cheek. She's not really suggesting like her climate crazy friends that we don't have children in the name of climate change. Uh, But a little alarming and a little eye opening. Go ahead. In immigrants, which I don't even know that that number even makes any sense because it it doesn't um, have streamed into the country since Joe Biden has been president. And you're claiming that that's too many people, that if more people come into the southern border, this is some sort of crisis because we, we've got too many people and we've got no more space and we can't afford more people. But now you're saying we need more kids. Can you explain who's the we and what's the purpose? You're also a senator from the state of Alabama. God help the people there. Are you saying the state of Alabama needs more kids? Why does the state of Alabama need more kids? More kids for what? There was a time when the state of Alabama absolutely needed more kids because, you know, Alabama was a slave state. And the mandate of the planter class in Alabama was for black women to produce more kids because those kids were property. And they could work more kids and make more money on their plantations. Are you saying the state of Alabama needs more kids because you think that those populations will include people who are maybe destitute and desperate enough if you kick out the immigrants like a lot of y'all want to do and you can make them do the work that the migrants are doing now? Because that kind of sounds slavery-ish. Is the state of Alabama the we? And is, is, is that the why? I mean, you're also a white guy. Are you saying the we is white folks need more kids? 
Is this like a great replacement thing where you're concerned that there's not enough white people in the population versus the growth of the Latino population, the black population, the Asian American population? And so the we is white people need to make white women have more kids. And that's the we and that's the why, because it's a little creepy. Well, Handmaid's Tale, don't you think? Now, I've never seen The Handmaid's uh, Tale. I, I don't even know how to say it. But uh, I can tell you this. Um, I think white people need to have more kids. If you look at the stats, right, um, you've got, I think, the last ones I saw. And they're a little outdated, but they're probably not too far off. I think Hispanic households have, I think it's uh, 2.5 children per family. Uh, black Americans have 1.5 kids per family. And I think white Americans were at like 0. 0.5, at least, again, the last time I looked. Those numbers might be skewed, but the percentage differences are probably the same. Probably still Hispanics in number one, uh, blacks in number two, and, and, and whites in number three. I, I don't remember what Asians were on, on that list. But my point is, I think anybody who wants to make an impact and you want to have um, legacy, then I think you should have some kids, right? I mean... How does one's name live on? How does one's culture and family uh, lineage and heritage and history live on? But for photo albums and, you know, the Bureau of Vital Statistics and actual people. So, yeah, I think everybody should have more kids. You know, what would I do if I didn't have kids? I'd be a rap when I'm done. It's probably going to be a rap when I'm done anyway. Right? It's not like my kids are going to jump on the airwaves and be like, hey, you know, <laughs> I'm here sitting in for my dad. I, they're not into this. So, my point is, yeah, the more kids you have, the the, the better, I think. Uh, I don't I don't particularly want any new ones, but that's an age thing, right? My kids are big, and um, I don't want to have more kids at this point in my life at 45. But I don't see anything wrong with having more kids, right? I, I don't understand Joy Reid's uh, attack on Tuberville here saying, are you afraid that the Hispanics are going to outpace you? I think he should be. I think he should be. I think if you, you know, listen, I... I, I, I should mention this. I was in Puerto Rico this weekend. I had a great time. If you want to see the, some of the videos or pictures, you can check them out on my Instagram story uh, or on my Instagram page, at uh, Rich Valdez with an S. But uh, I had a good time. And I there's something comforting about the, the traditions of my family that my parents uh, introduced me to when I was a child. You know, songs that I may not have heard, certain foods that I haven't eaten in ages. Uh, these are nice things. I think culture is a beautiful thing. And whatever your culture is, right? You know, let's say you're a third generation uh, born here in the U.S. That's fine. doesn't mean that you lack culture. It just means you, you've been here longer and there's more legacy in, 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 in our country. But it doesn't mean that if you're you know, an Irish American and, and your, your mom and grandma were not born in Ireland, but it was your great grandma that was born in Ireland, doesn't mean that you haven't eaten some corned beef and cabbage. Right. And you've lost uh, any sense of tradition. And if you did, then shame on you. But tradition ex exists nonetheless. And, and my point in all this is tradition's great and, and family's great. And the more the merrier. Why would we want to limit that? And why would we attack somebody for saying that we should have more children? Uh, I think the real question we have to ask is, Joy Reid, why would you liken parenting to slavery and again i understand some of the similarities if you're being um uh again tongue-in-cheek there but why attack somebody for wanting to to procreate to me that's crazy it's one of the highest and holiest honors i think you could have in life so joy reed i think you made a mistake here and if you're around give me a call anyway Anybody else wants to give a call, you can too. 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Mr. Call Screener, who is a budding radio star, by the way. Richie Valdez is terrific. This is America at Night 
with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, America, welcome back. And uh, we're going to get to your calls. I see we have calls from all over the country. Uh, let's go to Idaho. Wayne in Bonners Ferry, Idaho. You're on with Rich Valdez. Welcome. Hey, Rich. How you hey. doing? Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I, I really appreciate your show and your insight, and I think you have a grasp on everything. Um, but I would like to give you some of my insight on my experience with the um, the black community. My my girlfriend is black, and okay. she has three beautiful kids. All right, her sister has four kids, and her mother has six kids. I don't know any black families with only two children in them. They value family over almost anything. And I don't care what happens within their community, they still are accepted. And there's nothing like going to Thanksgiving with a black family and the love that's felt within there, their core is a matter of fact, that's their value. They feel that without children, they have no life or their life is so much more diminished, you know? And yeah, I love their kids. I love the people. I love the culture of it all. And, you know, uh, it's, it seems to me that um, that's something that is lacking from the white communities where we base financial gain over our children sometimes. And um, I mean, are, I, are you white? I had two children. I am white. No, no question about that. Um, but I always felt more at home in that situation. Because my my grandmother had lots of children, my um, my mother was a family of six people, mm-hmm. and uh, I just think that this is disappearing. And when they we would have these family reunions up there, Connecticut Lake, which was just an isolated place that we'd all get together, and they right. were just the place would teem with love. Well, I have no doubt in my mind about that, uh, and I can tell you that that I believe um, this is very similar to to the way I was brought up, and that's exactly how it was. I think the the numbers that I was sharing might be uh, somewhat skewed, only because of of different issues, right? I don't think there's a lack of family values per se. Uh, I would agree with you. I think that there's um, a, a lot of uh, especially in our generation, right? If you're a Gen X or a baby boomer, I think you totally grew up in a, in a time where there was this um, absolute love of family, love your neighbor type of thing. And 100%, I'm with you. I think uh, as of late, uh, between the the huge push by Planned Parenthood, which almost exclusively puts their clinics in black neighborhoods, um, I think this, this has to do with, with reducing the amount of of families that come out. I mean, it, it, listen, by no, it's no mistake in my opinion that when you see a group of people that, ha- that have something that is very strong to them, and you brought up the example of, of, of black Americans and family values, I, I'm going to agree with you. I think that's exactly the case. If you are on the left and your goal is to, you know, like, the uh, Marxist organization known as uh, Black Lives Matter, that part of their their existence, right, was against the nuclear family. Why? I I could only speculate, but that was part of what they said in in their own words. Uh, and this is typical of Marxists um, to 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 break things apart, right? That's how they, they they thrive on dividing and conquering. So they focused on uh, how to make more fatherless homes. Right. Because this is what they did. Who did it? Democrats did it by way of legislation, creating welfare and and pushing dads out of the home, uh, especially with an emphasis on people that were poverty stricken. Uh, A good number of them happen to be black. So therefore, you now have you've introduced this incentive to have a fatherless home and it's carried on for 50 years and it's only exacerbated. It's only gotten worse. Uh, We see the same thing. 
uh, with with um, with dads in the home. We see the same thing with with having children, right? With that, the number, right? That birth rate going down. Uh, this doesn't mean that the the black community doesn't embrace the these things as as values. I agree with you, hundred percent. You know, uh, they don't just call their grandma grandma; they call her big mama, right? Because it, it, this was this was uh, she was in a big part of the family, and my my grandmother grew up in my house, so I, I get that. I really do. Uh, I think this really comes down to a weakening of strength. I think it also comes as no surprise that there's. Um, Years ago, they called it the down low movement inside of a lot of black churches in Atlanta and other southern places. And that uh, today is now part of the LGBTQ movement where people are. uh, I was just watching a TV show and the guy's like, oh, I'm a preacher's kid. My dad was a preacher, but I didn't agree with everything he said because, you know, they didn't really accept people like me that are gender fluid. And, you know, he was talking about how he liked to date men and women. He didn't go by bisexual or whatever term, you know, I, I had learned growing up about people that were interested in that lifestyle or swinger. But he he went by the term gender fluid. Uh, again, another product of a Marxist idea. Right. These are Marxist ideas. Um, if you want to debate that, you can. But ultimately, I think that's that's where this has its roots. So that's why there's so much emphasis on destroying the black family is because it was so strong, because you would find them in their Sunday best. At church on Sunday, people did respect, uh, you know, the dad in the home and, and still do. I mean, even on the street, if I can make a crass reference, I don't think it's crass, but, you know, um, the term OG, you know, I think even on the street, people see a, a guy that has years in the game, years on the street. They they have respect for this man. Right. So I think these things uh, are are inculcated into the culture. And you're right. Th- those values are there. I think what we've seen is a systemic attack on blacks uh, and not necessarily from racists uh, per se, but it could be, but from people that are looking to destroy the strength that comes from the black family that came from the black man. And, and, and that of course is a, you know, a travesty and a sin in and of itself, but excellent point that you bring up uh, Wayne. I really appreciate it. All right. You bet. All right, folks. Um, we're going to continue with the rest of your calls. I want to go to Paul in Zanesville, but we don't have enough time, so we're going to hold you until we get back from the break. There's the music. I knew it was coming. And uh, we'll continue with the rest of your calls straight ahead. The phone number, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. Don't go anywhere. By the way, your ratings are up. Congratulations, somebody. It's always nice to check. I like to see, even if they're friends, I like to see how are they doing. Are people listening, right? That's but right. But you're, you're doing great. America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, familia, welcome back, amigos. We continue with your phone calls and more. 833-482-5337-8334, Valdez. And during the break, I wanted to take a look at what is going on with those numbers. Uh, Cause I was giving you some stuff based on old numbers that I'd read a while back. And it seems uh, still on track uh, with, with what I mentioned to you earlier. Um, at least the, the order is still the same. Uh, Hispanics still having the highest amount of kids, uh, blacks coming in right behind them, whites right behind them and Asians right behind them. And the, um, I think the biggest disparity here, this chart that I'm looking at from Pew research probably has a, a, a the most robust breakdown that I'm looking at in terms of kids per household. But this one is 50% of Asian households only have two kids. 22% of Asian households only have one kid. 
and only 10% of Asian households have four or more children. By contrast, that doubles Hispanic households. 20% of them have more than four children. Um, 31% of them have more than three children. A whole third, 33% of them have more than two children. And only 17%, it's the lowest of all these categories, uh, only have one child. And, uh, and I was going through my brain trying to think, how many of my friends are only children? And I thought of two. <laughs> so uh, I think that that bears some truth both uh, statistically and anecdotally. Now, I wanted to continue with the rest of your calls, but I do want to share a story with you. This is something I saw right during the break since we were talking about birth rates and everything. Uh, Fox News is reporting that Japan's government is now urging action as the country sees the lowest number of births since when? 1899. Japan's birth rate has dropped for the eighth consecutive year, reaching a historic low in 2023 uh, with a 5.1% decline from the year before. So just imagine that. What is going on in Japan? Why aren't people having kids? We'll talk about that uh, as we uh, work our way through your calls. And I don't want to leave you hanging on the calls. I said I was going to go to Paul in Zanesville, Ohio, W-H-I-Z. Paul, you're on with Rich Valdez. Go right ahead. Hey, good evening, Rich. Yeah, I'm just going to echo your sentiments here a little bit. You know, I come from a family of seven. Um, uh, well, I had six siblings. And um, uh, when Joy Reid says, which, you know, I, I, I don't really have a, a, a like for Joy Reid or Joy Behar in either one. Now, she just shows her ignorance uh, when she says something like that, because here's what I think. And it's just an opinion, Rich. Um, the, with the breakdown of the family that is a lot of what has to do with a lot of American problems, you know, and that's why I like Larry right. Elder, you know, Love Larry uh, yeah. Elder. and I think, yeah. And I, I think that's a lot of what's wrong with America is the breakdown of, I guess you would call it the nuclear family, but you know, uh, that's just my opinion. And, um, I, like I said, I come from a family of seven and we're, we're pretty close now. Um, you know, we had some problems back when mom and dad died with the will and everything that I'd done and everything. I was a race car driver for 18 years, Rich. Get and out of here. Um, there were some things out what, there. What, what, yeah, anything yeah. I might have seen, like NASCAR or Indy? I drove dirt late model out of Muskegon wow. County Speedway. Yeah, and I, and I drove it with a guy, and he was my mentor. His name was Donnie Moran. He was called the Million Dollar Man. He won the first million in El Doro. Uh, that is so, so cool. But Paul, anyway. how, fast, how fast did you take your car? Well, it was just about a three-eighths mile, a little over, and most of the time when you had a good night or something, you was averaging about 100 mile an hour down the straightaway, maybe just a little faster. And then when you hit the turns, you know, you just, uh, well, you'd have to see it to believe it. (laughs) Well, I have. I did a few times. I've actually been on my top, to tell you the truth. But but anyway, yeah, I think what's happening is the breakdown of the family, and everything like that. I think that's a lot of what's wrong with America and our religion. You know, people aren't paying enough attention to God because when you do something like what I've done, you know, uh, racing cars. You rely on God, right? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> exactly. You got to pray now and then. Yeah. So that's about, that's about, you know, what I wanted to say tonight. Well, you know, Paul, let me ask you a question. Uh, and um, um, I agree with you on a lot of stuff here. Uh, there, There is an old saying and it's backed up by scripture. It's, you know, in in layman's terms, there's strength in numbers. And mm-hmm. when you have a family, like when I was a little kid, I remember we, we my parents split up and um, I moved to Jersey City, New Jersey. And I don't know, some kids got, they said something stupid. I said something stupid back to them. And the next thing you know, they, they brought their brothers um, to, oh, actually, I didn't say something. I punched a kid in the face. And then his big brother came. He was like, oh, why'd you hit my brother? And I was like, oh, I got brothers, too. So I went and I got my brothers and, you know, the whole thing happened. But that 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 was the strength. Right. It, you know, I, I was able to do that because I was the little one and I knew there was a whole bunch of big ones behind me. So, you know, it, it was um, that, that's how I was raised. Now, you you um, you look at that example of strength in numbers and. There's strength in every number, right? In, in, in all these numbers, whether it's a family or a bigger family, multiple families that make up a village or a tribe. And, and this idea is, I don't know, older than dirt, right? You know, it goes back to the Garden of Eden and where they made families, Cain, Abel, and whatever. And I look at all of that and I think if you want to weaken something that 
is historically strong to, from like the beginning of time, which is family and these bonds, then that's how you do it, right? Even in crime, you know, it's organized crime family. Gangs are, are replacement families and, and that they derive their strength from their numbers. And it, it's when you weaken that, you weaken the family by removing the leader of the, of the home, the, the dad, the high priest, as it's known spiritually. Um, you, weaken, you weaken the household. You weaken that family structure. When you uh, then eliminate some of the children and make family sizes smaller, you further weaken it. Uh, you introduce radical feminism that tells women that they don't need no man and that they can do whatever men can do and do it better. And voila, now you have a recipe for disaster where it's almost impossible for people to get along in relationships anymore because the gender roles, forgive me for using that term, not, um, are now confused and, and convoluted. And people are thinking, well, no, I can do whatever and you can do whatever and we can do. And, and nobody understands that th this weakening it just creates chaos. And what do we have? The result, we have children that end up in therapy, children that end up with all sorts of disorders and you, you name it and they've got it. And that's where we are today. Right. So we've got kids that are gravitating towards crime, kids that are almost guaranteed for incarceration, kids that are going to become uh, problematic in school because of behavior issues, all because their family structure at home is lacking. And you spend more of your time spinning your wheels trying to make up for the deficit that you're not able to build. You know, um, in, in a home where there's more stability, you create more stable, more productive children. Now, and this is not a slight on any single parent anywhere. I think most of them do absolutely everything they can do and to the best of their ability. And in fact, I, my kids, you know, were little when I got divorced. So in fact, they were raised by two single parents, if you will, even though we, we co-parented uh, somewhat through electronic communications, but I didn't really speak to my ex-wife a ton. Uh, so it, it, there, there were, and she had her differences of opinion and I had mine on how we were going to rear our children. And that was confusing for the kids, but that is a reality of life. And, and kids have to live through that if you're going to be in that position. And, and my point in all of this is that is how you, you, you break things, right? That's how you weaken things. You, you, uh, you start chopping, chopping from the knee, you know, below the knee or at the base of it. It's like chopping down a tree and, and yelling timber. And that's what's been happening to the American family, I think, as you've pointed out. So you add in, you know, not just radical feminism and fatherless homes, but now you add in the idea that uh, we're going to abort a number of children and make our family sizes smaller because we can't afford them anymore. And there we have it. We have where we are today. And, and I think this is uh, an issue that, uh, you know, I'm happy to talk about. And I'm glad that there's people like Larry Elder and you and others that are interested in having that conversation because it's an important one. And it also has to do with um, the institution of marriage. You know, some people say, oh, you don't need marriage. It's just a piece of paper. It's just, and that. well, guess what? That piece of paper tends to provide, I think, a lot more benefit uh, than not having it and, and, and an incentive to stick around, an incentive to see things through to the end. And it, when, when you put all these things together, you can have a way stronger family, a way stronger community, a way stronger society. But when you take all those things out and you add all these things that the radical left has introduced, boom, your recipe for the disaster that we see today, the broken family. Paul, thank you for your call. Thanks for listening to my rant on that. Obviously, something that's passionate to me. I think it's, uh, it's hard to raise a strong family. And uh, kudos to everybody out there that's doing it. And uh, my hope is that more and more people will choose to do it despite the challenges of divorce or this, that, and the other. It's not impossible. It just takes a lot of work. Don't go anywhere, folks. I'm Rich Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Breaking it down. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now. 
833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, America, welcome back. We continue our conversation. And uh, just a quick headline for you. Uh, this one is coming from the Post Millennial. Honduran illegal immigrant arrested for the rape of a 14-year-old girl at knife point and the separate stabbing of someone else in Louisiana. Uh, for anybody who's doubting that when Trump said they're rapists, they're murderers, right? Uh, I will, I will um, double down on this any day of the week because it was mainly... Uh, the people in the Hispanic community that just turned their back on Trump, that were just like, oh, this guy's a monster. And, you know, the, the, there was already people that hated him, um, you know, uh, in the media on the left. But there were so many people that, you know, ostracized me, saying, how could you? You're a sellout. He hates us. And, and I thought to myself, you don't really understand how this works. And here it is. Now that Biden's letting everybody and their mother in, they're coming after your kids. Nobody's daughter is safe anymore. A Honduran man has been arrested in Kenner, Louisiana, for a series of violent crimes, including assault and rape. According to the Kenner police, um, on February 20th, one of them, one of the crimes included the rape of a 14-year-old girl at Knife Point. This guy's name is Angel Matias Castellanos Orellana, who was in the United States illegally, was identified as the suspect. The girl reportedly met Castellano on social media. media excuse me. Uh, just a few days later on, Sunday, February 25th, police responded at 3.15 in the morning uh, to calls uh, a report of a stabbing incident. According to police, a man was exiting his vehicle and approached by Castellanos Orellana, who demanded his property. Officers said that Castellano stabbed the victim multiple times in his face and in his back during the robbery. The responding officers located a Mr. Oriana at the scene covered in blood. Fox News uh, Channel 8 reported that the victim was taken to the hospital, hosti- take two, hospital and is in stable condition. He was arrested and booked on armed robbery, aggravated uh, battery, first degree, and uh, first degree rape as well as aggravated assault. And a federal ICE detainer was also issued for him. So there we have it. Just another incident of of another illegal immigrant who's raping a 14-year-old girl. We had the college student that was, uh, we don't know if she was raped, but we know she was murdered. I mean, it just seems like it's not ending. ICE arrests a Guatemalan illegal immigrant convicted of sexually assaulting a child in Boston. It's another story just from today. I want to get to your calls, but I think these are important things to discuss. <clears throat> 34-year-old Guatemalan national was arrested in Gloucester, Massachusetts on February 21st. He'd been convicted of indecent assault on, and battery on a minor under the age of 14. The man had been released and now has an immigration detainer. <clears throat> Hopefully they find the guy. This illegal immigrant had also been convicted of a separate assault and battery offense and was ordered to be on the sex offender registry. Look at that. So you get to do this more than once in a country that you're not even a a citizen of, right? I don't know if this guy works. Oh, he's coming here for a better life. No, this guy's coming here to rape children. He's already got two sexual assault charges. Listen, Uh, I've got no words anymore. Let's go to the calls. Uh, Let's see. Where do we go here? Derek, Jamestown, New York. Go right ahead. WJTN. What up, come? What up, compadre Brown Ball and breaking it down? Yes, sir. What's up, my compadre? What, what do you want to argue with me about tonight? You want to defend the illegal aliens raping girls? Uh, oh, you know, I got a, a composite capsule that I want you to swallow. But the thing about <laughs> your hairstyle, you know what I like about your hairstyle, Rich? What's that? There's no hair. <laughs> that's, that's what I like about it, too. We're going to get it going. You got big things. We're going to accomplish some great, beautiful things. But what I talked about, defending the Caucasian, the ultra-powerful Caucasian all over the world, he had to wait in history for his time. He had a brief success in uh, Greece, 
Now we got the military, uh, Putin, he's leading in uh, war and killing. Uh, one of the things that people got to understand, we cannot approach any of these situations with logic because it's illogical. When we try to apply logic to something that's illogical, it's going to seem weird to us. So we're dealing with a narcissistic sociopath. And this is one of the things that he got honestly in his system. And that's why his behavior is the way it is. Nobody understands. They close schools in Alexandria, Egypt. You don't bomb schools. You don't bomb hospitals. You yeah. don't bomb people. That <clears throat> you should tell that to Hamas, Derek. Hey, Derek, hang on a second. I got to take a quick pause here. We'll come right back to you. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, Derek, Jamestown, New York. We're picking up where we left off. What's going on with the Caucasian? Yes, uh, globally and genetically, he is my son, genetically. So all over the world, he's ruling. He's got ultra power. And when we deal with the ones with ultra power, we have to use a mind of justice, cause and effect. Why he does the things that appear to seem weird and ill, murder. Uh, uh, so why is Putin murdering and stealing land? Is it because he's Caucasian? Is that what you're saying? No, because he has the power. He knows he has the power. He knows that. Uh, uh, I think that's a- an area where you and I both agree. I think Putin did not do it because he did not have the power during the Trump years, knowing that Trump had more power than him. But now that he knows Biden is weak and frail in many ways, he says, you know what? I have the power and I'm going to use it. And I think uh, we agree on something, Derek. Big shout out to Derek in Jamestown, New York, WJTN. Thank you for your call, my brother. Let's go to Brent in La Crosse, Wisconsin, WIZM. Brent, go right ahead. Yeah, I was just continuing with your story earlier about uh, the family, nuclear family being destroyed. Psalms eleven yeah. three says, when the foundations are destroyed, which are the families and communities, what can the righteous do? Well, there's nothing we can do. And that, that's the devil's job. But anyway, 2 Kings chapter 17 talks about what's happening in America. Hoshea was the last king of Israel, and Samaria was resettled. Assyria was the world power, and instead of having a scorched earth policy, they'd mix the races. Yeah. Well, they mixed the races and they tried to uh, to make it. I'd love to hear the rest of that story, honestly, um, from your perspective. Uh, so, Brent, hopefully you can call back and uh, we can hear the rest of it. Folks, that's all I've got for tonight. Uh, Paul in Boise, Diane in Chicago on WGN, thank you for your call. Hasta mañana. Until the next time, hasta la próxima. I am Rich Valdez. Take care. Good night and God bless.